This is the final lecture in understanding sort of how to implement this POD or thinking about optimal basis selection and uh, it's introductory and I want to give a simple example uh, and code it up directly here in MATLAB so you can see exactly how we might build a reduced order model using this POD architecture. So the equation we're going to consider is one that is one of my favorites. It's the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. There it is. So it's got time, it's got space. This is a dispersive term. It's very similar to what we considered previously, which was the harmonic oscillator, except now the potential is some nonlinear function of u itself. Okay, so this equation we want to solve. It's a, it's, a, it's a classical model, a canonical model for nonlinear wave evolutions. And we want to talk about how we might be able to implement some scheme here, take advantage of reduced uh, dimensions. So first let's set up the architecture for solving this thing using, uh, for instance, a Fourier mode expansion basis, which is what you might try numerically to solve this with as a spectral method. Um, so I can basically take everything and move it to the right-hand side and now multiply by i uh, or minus i, which is even better because minus i here will give me minus i squared. i squared is negative 1, so I just get ut. And then minus i will be i over 2 u x x. Minus i here was plus i mod u squared u. Okay, so now we're setting up this to be in this frame of how ut is changing. And you see I've pretty much got this thing uh, set up to be solved. Okay, so one way to solve this is using a Fourier basis. And if I use a Fourier basis, then all I have to do is Fourier transform this thing. And that will put it in the Fourier domain, and then I can evolve in that domain. So let's talk about how I might do that architecturally. And then we'll talk about how we might do this instead using some other basis, in particular some optimal basis, which you might select using proper orthogonal decomposition. So if I want to take the Fourier transform of this, and it's going to be a Fourier transform in the x direction, then this becomes u hat. So the hat denotes the Fourier transform. And remember, in the x direction, I take Fourier transform. Here, two, the transform of two derivatives gives me minus kx squared uxx. So I get minus i over 2, the wave number, u, plus i times Fourier transform of this nonlinear term, which I'll denote by Fourier transform of. So the nonlinearity, of course, creates a little bit of a problem, but not that big a deal. We have to Fourier transform, evaluate that nonlinear term, Fourier transform. So now what we have is a first order ODE in terms of the u hat variable. And so I can actually plug this in to my ODE45 time stepper and solve for this thing. Okay, so that's going to be our, our method we might use if we're going to use a Fourier basis. Now, if I use a different basis, let's say from snapshots that I might take, I might take snapshots of this system, and then I could construct, in fact, potentially, an optimal basis in which to, to look at this thing in. And we'll do that in a moment, but first, I want to take a look at what the dynamics look like. Remember, that the first step in this POD process is that I actually have to first take some snapshots of my original system. Okay, so I'm going to leave this bottom equation here. And what we're going to do is we're going to program it up in MATLAB so that we can, in fact, produce solutions to this equation. In particular, I'm going to solve this numerically using Fourier mode expansion, which is the solutions to this nonlinear Schrodinger equation. All right, so let's come here to the computer, pull up some MATLAB. This MATLAB up here. And uh, let's go ahead and take out what I had before. OK, start brand new. So remember, we're trying to solve this set of equations. So we have to find, define a domain. And then once we've defined that domain, we have to discretize it. And then we step forward into the future using something like what we're going to use here is 
uh, ODU45, which is a runger keto method. And then we're going to take a look at the solution at PD and ask the following, which is, what is the right embedding space of the dynamics? Okay, so what the POD does is says, I'm going to give you the optimal basis set. And so part of what we'd like to do is do solutions of this and figure out what is, in fact, the optimal embedding space. So let's define some domain, size uh, 30, cut them to 512 points. Okay, so that's my first step in evaluating this, this algorithm. And let me uh, get my set of notes here that I, yeah, all right, here we go, that I want to work with. And once I have this, I can define my domain, x2 is a linear space. It goes from negative L over 2 to L over 2 and n plus 1 points. And x is equal just the first 1 through n points. Okay, so I've got my domain, size 30, chop it in 512 points. The x over there is, in fact, the spatial domain I'm going to work on. Okay, so I've defined that. Uh, I also want to define my wave numbers at this point. These are going to be, because I'm going to work in the Fourier domain, and notice I have a k squared here. So this k squared are the Fourier wave numbers, so cosine kx, so cosine 1x, cosine 2x, cosine 3x, or sine 1x, sine 2x. Those are the wave numbers that we're going to expand all our solutions in. In fact, we're going to have 512 of these wave numbers. We're not, actually, we're going to go from e to the negative i kx to e to the plus i kx, where n goes from negative, negative i 256x to e to the i 256x. Okay? So the wave numbers get scaled by the domain. So I go from a L size domain down to a 2 pi periodic domain. That's what this scaling factor does. And, oops, here are my wave numbers. Oops, here we go to negative 1. All right, so remember in FFT, in the wave number space, it shifts it around like this. So this shift builds that into, takes that into account. And so now I have my wave numbers. So once I have my wave numbers and I have my domain defined, I can define some initial data. So let's go ahead and define my initial conditions as u is equal to hyperbolic secant of x. You'll see why I've defined that in a minute. It turns out that this is what's called a soliton solution to the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And my initial condition is its Fourier transform. There it is. So I take my initial data, I Fourier transform it, and now I can plug it into a formula like this. This is going to be on the right-hand side. So I've got to call OD45 to pull, to pull this thing in. So let me lift this to the top. And now I'll come back up to here and say, OK, I'm going to call T and UT sol is equal to OD45. So what am I doing here? I'm going to pull that out of my solution. The time at which I have the solution in UT sol is the solution in the transform domain. That's what the UT stands for. So each row of this matrix is going to be solution at time 0, time 1, time, or however I specify it. In fact, let's go ahead and specify it here. T will go from 0. Let's make it a linear space. It's going to go from 0 all the way to 2 pi in 41 steps. So it's going to start at 0 and take 40 steps all the way to time 2 pi. Okay, so around 6.28. So we'll talk about why I pick those numbers later as you see the evolution of this thing. But I can pick any time scale I want there. I can just run it for as long as I want, or as low, as short as I want, sample as finely as I want. So that's my time variable. So now I can go to 045 and call in, oops, put this, oop, 045, NLS, RHS. So this is going to call a function, NLS underscore right hand side dot M, which will have all my right hand variables. And what I'm going to send in there, I'm going to send there the time, the initial condition. Uh, I'm not going to send in anything to do with fixing up the tolerances. So that will be empty. Uh, I'm going to send in the k. Because I'm just going to need those wave numbers. And this time, I'm going to put that semicolon on the end so I don't see all the stuff come off. 
So they go, I called it, and we'll build the right hand side function in a minute. Once I've called it, now I have to see, figure out what I want to plot. So let's just go through this loop. One, j is going to go from one to length t. What I'm going to do in this loop is I'm going to say the solution, each row of the solution, um, will be the inverse Fourier transform of each row of ut sol. So I'm going to go ahead and IFFT ut sol j row. Okay? So what I've done here is I've defined this variable u solution. Each row of it is the solution at time 0 all the way to time 2 pi, stepped into 40 steps. Okay, so I got to go grab each row, inverse Fourier transform it from back in the regular u domain instead of this ut domain. And then once I have that, I can actually plot my solution. Okay, so let's go ahead and plot this solution. Uh, surf L, uh, T versus X versus um, absolute value U sol. And plot the absolute value because if you remember, uh, this is going to be complex numbers. There's these I's floating around, so it's a complex number that has an amplitude and a flat phase. And so by plotting the absolute value, I, I clear that out. Otherwise, I can plot the real part, imaginary part. Okay? So that's pretty much the whole outside loop. The inside loop is just constructing that right-hand side. So I purposely left it like this. So let's come over here, start with what I had previously, NLS right-hand side. So what this is, is now going to be a function call. And notice what I do when I send in all my variables. And this time I'm not sending in this V. That was from the harmonic oscillator. Let's send this in. First thing I do is take ut, which is initial condition. It's in the Fourier domain. I pull out u. So once I have u, I can define everything here. Okay. So the right-hand side, it's going to be simply, uh, I, what I have down there is a minus i over 2 times, there's a k squared, times ut. That's this term here. So this term here sits right there. Then I have this, plus i times Fourier transform of the absolute value of u squared, let's put some parentheses around that, times u. Okay? And I can cut out some of these spaces, so close it up a little bit. Okay, there. So now you can see everything on one line. So this first, first term here is this term here. It takes care of the derivative terms. Second term here is the Fourier transform of the nonlinear terms, and now we got that taken care of. Okay? Now we're going to save this. Save as. NLS, RHS.M, save. Now we can go back to the main code and just run this thing. See how we do. Oh, of course, didn't run. Oops, here we go. All right, well, let's see what the. Uh, I think right, I'm trying to see what the. There, okay, dimensions didn't agree. That's because. Uh, when I define my k vector out here, I'm going to have to define it, the transpose of it. It's supposed to be a column. Okay, now we can run it. And, let's see if this, oops, so now it doesn't like what it did. Uh, okay, I think I defined surf wrong. Surf, I think it might be. T, I have those backwards. Let's see if that works. There we go. All right. So now we got this right. I'm going to erase all this. But anyway, hopefully you saw that process and how easy it was to program up this PDE. And that's kind of, uh, you know, when you're using spectral methods, it's kind of as easy as that. We just did a basis expansion method. And at the end of the day, what POD is, 
is just a basis expansion method. And here I've used Fourier, Fourier basis, so ahead of time I just pick that basis. The nice thing has this, some nice properties, including spectral accuracy and analog end speed to compute these things, so it works out very quickly. And here's the result of this. And what I'm going to do is trade that out, because in the end of the day, I solved for 512 coupled differential equations when I did this. And here's the solution to this thing. And by the way, I'm going to go ahead and do a shading and terp here and a color map hot. I like color map hot. And there it goes. Boom. All right. So there we go. That is our solution. We can rotate it around. Just a little pulse that propagates. So then, of course, the question I can ask is, if you look at this, it just looks like a little, basically a lump that doesn't change. In fact, the phase is changing, but the overall structure is not. So it asks, begs the question. I just solved a 512 dimensional differential equation. What's the dimension of my system? I can look at that thing and I can see it's pretty low dimensional. And so the question is, how do I go about actually computing not only the low dimensionality, but what mode or what subspace best approximates this, this evolution that we have here. And of course, this is a very simple evolution, right? If we can all agree to that, but I want to try to get a little bit more concrete about how I'm going to go ahead about approximating this. All right, so let's go to this. So uh, first of all, since I've plotted this, I'm going to make this a new section in my code. And what I'm going to do is go ahead and align up my data. If you remember, you saw the way it's lined up right now is the rows are time, columns are space. I'm going to switch that around and make a data matrix X is equal to uh, you saw. I'm going to transpose that. So now spatial information is this way, the columns are time. That's going to make you have the spatial information and V have the time information. So let's go plot this thing. Let's just do a SVD of this thing to see what we get. So SVD X. And then what I'm going to do is uh, plot here the diag of S divided by the sum of diag of S, right? And then let's plot that in black circles, line width two. Run that section. Oh, make a new figure. Figure two. There's figure two. So what does it tell you? Well, it looks to me like you have one mode, and remember these are now percentages because I plotted the diag over the sum of the diags. About 100% of the variance is contained in one mode. The rest pretty much look like zeros. Maybe a better way to see this is on a semi log y plot. You can see that they're not going to be exactly zeros. Here they are. You get the first mode, which is order one. The next mode is down here around 10 to minus 6. And then it decays. By the way, you expect this. Why do you expect this? Because when I solve this thing with OD45, the numerical round off just from the time stepping scheme in the OD45 scheme is set around 10 to minus 6. So you clearly see this is actually just an artifact of your OD stepper. This whole set of singular values is just numerical round off from solving your ODE. Okay? So it's down on numerical round off level, so the only mode that really matters is this one here. So that's your one mode dominance. And we saw that in the picture, right? The picture here of the dynamics clearly says one mode. So what I'm going to try to do is change out the 512 modes replace a 500, solving a system for 512 ODEs by solving a system with one ODE. Okay, that is going to be the primary idea of doing this reduction. Okay, so uh, let's see what that mode looks like, by the way, and let's see what the other modes look like. So I'm going to come down here. First thing I'm going to do, figure three, is I'm going to plot the first three modes. So I'm going to plot U, 1 to 3. 
Yeah, and I want to plot these on a using line width two. Okay, so when I do that, oops. And by the way, the reason you're seeing that is because these are actually have complex phases. So let's plot, for instance, the real part. Oops, the real part. Here it is. Okay, this is interesting. What is that going on? So first of all, I plotted the first mode, which actually, if I were to take away the second and third mode, in fact, let me do that for a moment. Let me just plot mode one. Mode one, the dominant mode, looks exactly like you expect. It's a bump. It's turned upside down, but it has to make the decision whether to give it to you up or down and give it to you looking down. Okay, that doesn't matter. It's a bump, and remember, it's multiplied by the singular value and by the v. First column of v, we can actually look at that as well, right? So let's look at figure four. Plot the real part, v. Okay, run. And here's its time dynamics basically oscillating. So remember, it has a this is the real part. The real part's actually going some cycle like this. And so you see this is your time dynamics associated with this mode here. And notice that it starts with a negative value. So you're going to multiply this negative by that negative, which makes a positive. Okay? So that's how that thing works out. Now let's look at those second and third modes. Let's put back here where we're going to go look at what, what are these third mode and second mode looking like. And I'm going to run ahead this again. And now, if I look at this thing, so first of all, let's consider this thing here. And I'm going to zoom in. This is the second and third mode. What this is, is garbage. It's basically generated from the round off of the numerical error that I'm making. So those modes are meaningless. And in fact, if you started to try to build a reduced order model with these modes, you'd be in real trouble because these will cause your system to essentially blow up. Okay? So you don't want to use these type of modes. And by the way, their time dynamics look like the orange and the red there. Okay? So, but remember, these are not, uh, these are not modes. They're, they're very energetic. They're, they're, they're six order magnitude below the first mode. And it's basically, if when you do an SVD, it's guaranteed to give you as many modes as you have either rows or columns, regardless if they have any physical meaning. You're guaranteed to get them. Okay? So what you're doing here is you're saying, well, the whole thing is one mode, but I'm going to give you all the other modes from your sampling matrix. And in this case, there was 41 modes because I took 41 snapshots as I evolved this around. So this gives us an idea of how to build a one degree of freedom model out of the system. Question is, how do we actually do it? So let's go ahead and do this analytically, walk it through so you can see how this looks, this process looks, and then we will actually go ahead and do a little bit harder problem. Okay, remember what we're solving. Not only showing you. So we have that, and what we're going to do is say, say, we said there's one mode that matters. So my solution U is just A of T times that mode that matters. I don't even need to call it V1. Let's just call it Psi, Psi of X. And my numerics told me that what this actual specific form is. So I'm going to plug it in here. So IUT. Well, time derivative of this. The prime will denote time differentiation. You just get something like that. Plus 1 half. Plug it in here. Well, that's a function of time alone. That psi picks up the two time derivatives. Plus Uh, 
Okay. So that's what we have so far. And now what we can do is apply orthogonality. Take the inner product of this with respect to psi. And here's the deal. You only have one mode. The inner product with itself, what it gives out for you is an orth orthonormal basis. So you have this. So when I take the inner product with respect to this psi, what I get is here, psi, psi is going to give me 1. Okay? So you're going to get i a prime plus 1 half a. This is a little more interesting, which is the inner product of this function with respect to its derivatives. Okay? Plus nonlinearity inner product, the nonlinear term with respect to its uh, nonlinear function there. Okay? So those are the things you can numerically evaluate. Right? You can take this psi, take the derivatives, compute that integral. You can take the function, square it times self times this, and you can compute that integral. So everything can, can be computed here. And what you end up with is a very simple differential equation. I plus, I'm calling this alpha over 2A plus beta. So what I get is a first order differential equation if I do a one mode expansion. And remarkably, there's not that many differential equations you can solve exactly, but this one I can. And let me just write down the solution for you. A of t is equal to a naught exponent i alpha 2 t plus beta a naught squared t. So solve this exactly. So now all of a sudden what I've got here, and a naught by the way is the initial condition for, for a, which I can find by just plugging in the initial conditions here. Um, and so I have this exact expression. So once I have a of t, I can plug it in here and I'm done. That's the whole solution to the problem if I do a one mode expansion. Okay? So in this case, it's not even clear I need to build a reduced order model because I can solve it, solve it exactly. So sometimes you get lucky in life, and here's one case where this thing works out beautifully in your favor and you have a full analytic solution, and that's not going to happen very often for you. However, uh, in fact, we're going to look at this and just take the same example and make it a little bit more complicated and have to go to an architecture where we have to solve this full thing in a reduced basis method. Okay? So that was a one-mode truncation, and you can see the advantages. Now I trade it out for, instead of having 512 degrees of freedom, what I had was one degree of freedom, which was to determine this A of T. Okay? And I could get this A of T uh, through taking inner products and using orthogonality, and then it's just done. That's my solution technique that I have. Now, when you do this, generically, you can't solve it analytically, but you're going to basically do the same thing, which is you're going to calculate how many modes you need, and then you're going to project onto those modes, write down a simpler set of ODEs, which you can then solve using something like OD45. So let me show you this example. I'm going to go back to the same code we had. Here we go. And what I'm going to do with this, so I'm going to come up here, and I'm going to only change one thing. This. Instead of a setch, it's going to be two setch. What you're going to see is a fundamental change in the way this solution evolves. In fact, now what we're going to get is what's called a two soliton. And you'll see some of these figures that come up. So I'm running this section, and it's going through. And up will pop for us some diagnostics. I believe so. Okay. Probably don't need 512 modes. It'll run faster if I don't have that many. I think I ran it. Didn't I push run? Oh, I see. Let's do run here. Okay, it's busy. There we go. Okay, all right. Let's pull these things together here. 
Sorry, we'll go one at a time. So first of all, figure one. Let's rotate this around so you can look at it. What this is just is this structure that oscillates like this. It's a two soliton solution. It looked a little bit, it looks a little bit like what we had in the harmonic oscillator, but all the dynamics is being driven by this nonlinearity. And it produces this nice structure here. This is a, what's called the two soliton. And so you can see it just evolves along. And the reason I picked two pi to go into the future is because I exactly catch a period, two periods of this oscillation, right? So it's one, two. Okay, actually, I guess it's four periods of this oscillation. So, you know, I could sample somewhere in between, but I just decided I want to sample an even number of periods or, or, or an integer number of periods. So we have that in this thing here. So that's our dynamics we want to look at. Again, I've solved with 512 modes, but this thing clearly looks very low dimensional. How low dimensional is it? Well, I can come back now to the singular value spectrum, and here I am again on a log plot. I have two dominant modes, okay? And these two modes are up here around order one, and the next mode down here is between 10 to the minus one and 10 to the minus two, and then I get this nice decay. So you get a more modes up here. And in fact, I want to show you this maybe now back on, instead of a log scale, let me show this to you um, on a normal scale, on a percentage scale. So let's go back from semi-log y to just regular plot. And let's run this section. And there you go. Oops, that's a little big. There we go. Okay, so now what I have here as you can see the modes, the first mode has about 62% of the variance. Second mode here has about, I don't know, 34%. And then this third mode has about 4%. And then you can see this drop off. So it's certainly more than one degree of freedom. You might say it's two or three. Uh, you can decide how to truncate that. We're going to talk a lot about truncation later. But for right now, we're going to just try to do a two-mode truncation, which will capture about 95% of the total variance of the system. Now, what do the modes look like? Uh, well, let's go look at them. Here are the modes. I'm going to blow these up so we can take a better look. First mode is the blue. Second mode is this red. Third mode is that orange one. So these are the first three modes that come out of this. Now, what we're going to try to do is construct a solution to this thing using the blue, and the red. Those are going to be our two modes that we're going to use. They have most of the variance. I'm going to see if we can write down an accurate approximation to this system in that case. And by the way, here's the time dynamics associated with those modes. We're looking again at the blue and the red and how they're evolving. Okay. So we'll come back to this and try to figure out if we can get an accurate reconstruction using a two-mode approximation to this system. All right, so before I do that, we have everything there, including the fact that we have the basis elements. What I'm going to do is start thinking about how to construct this. Remember, let's go back to the general architecture. Our general architecture was systems of this form. for reduced order modeling. And Remember what we did, our, our objective was to sample this dynamics and do an SVD, right? So once we sample the dynamics in this matrix and do our SVD, then we were going to take some low rank portion of this thing, which represents the number of modes we want to keep. Just like what we did previously with one soliton, now we're going to have more than one mode. We have two modes. So the idea is that we can represent this as something like this, where these are our basis set, and we need to determine the evolution of A. We plug this into here, right? And so this is our basis set, A prime. And then here, basis set, A plus and something like this. Okay? Let's see if I can get a non squeaky pin. So that's what we get from this thing. And then if we multiply both sides by 
phi r transpose and use the fact that phi r times phi r transpose, or phi r transpose times phi r is identity, we end up with this is our linear term. There's our nonlinear term. Okay? So that's kind of what we have. And the nice thing is we could pre compute this. if we would like, because all those terms don't change in time, but then we're going to have to figure out how to do this on the fly. Okay? So this is our goal, is to do this, and we have to do this now for nonlinear Schrodinger. And if you remember nonlinear Schrodinger, uh, what we had, let's, let's try to write nonlinear Schrodinger in this form. If you remember, it was IUT plus one half UXX plus mod U squared U equal to zero. And so I want to write this as a function of u. And so I can take this iut to the other side with negative iut, multiply by negative, uh, multiply by i, and that'll be plus ut. So then this thing will be ut is equal to i over 2 uxx plus i mod u squared u. So this term here is essentially going to be this projection here. So I'm going to try to hit this thing with a second derivative operator. Okay. And this here is taking your modes and then basically making them nonlinear. Okay. So this is going to be our objective in this construction. What we're going to do now is say, well, I got a two mode expansion. So what I'm going to do is this V of R is going to have mode one. Mode 2. Okay, that's what I just sampled from the NLS evolution. So if I have those two modes, what I'd like to do is construct this. Now, you could put in a two mode approximation directly into here, and so what you find is if A is two components A1 and A2, you'll find some dynamics that looks like this. Okay, that's a1 comma a2, a1 comma a2. So let me just try to make that a little bit clearer there. Okay, so you get some kind of dynamics. So it's a two by two ODE system, which is kind of nice. You can do phase plane analysis, but you actually maybe a little more difficult to solve analytically like we did before. But in either case, we can d certainly do this thing here, which is writing out all the terms and computing. So notice that phi is easy to compute, but now L acting on phi when we look at this nonlinear Schrodinger equation, part of the L is an I over 2, which is easy to pull out here. You get an I over 2. But then L acting on the phi of R means I have to find two derivatives of both the first mode and two derivatives of the second mode before I multiply these together. Okay? So let's keep that in mind. In fact, I'm going to write this up in the corner here, kind of what we've got to do. This A, I'm going to write here, so we're going to write it up high so we can program around it. A prime is a little too high. So A prime is equal to, this is going to be, I'm going to pull out this I over 2, and then I'm going to have the phi of R transpose. L acting on phi of R means that what I've got to do is basically compute phi 1 xx, phi 2 xx, and then that's times a. Okay? So this is the second derivative of one of the modes, second derivative of the other modes, multiply it by my modal matrix, and then times a. Okay, that's the first part of the ODE. Second part of the ODE is I've got to actually compute phi transpose r times this nonlinear term here. Well, I just got to compute that. So there's no, there's no way around that. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put it up here. We start erasing this. This is, the, this is my objective is to solve now. Plus here, 
I times this, right? So I'm going to pull out the I, and it's going to be phi R transpose times what's in here is I have to evaluate this nonlinear term, which um, I might as well just write it out, which is going to be uh, phi R times A squared times phi R A. Okay? That is our approximation in this two space. Okay? Now, what this amounts to then is solving a two by two ODE system. And it's fairly easy to solve. We can pre compute everything except for this nonlinear term here. So we have to keep updating this nonlinear term. So every time I change A, this nonlinear term and this projection onto this, onto this nonlinearity or into this bit modal basis changes. So that is actually where the computational expense comes from because I have to compute, com continue to compute inner products. So, uh, in fact, that is one of the going to be the main themes about how to make reduced order models work faster for you because computing these nonlinear inner products can be extremely expensive and you'd like to not spend a lot of computational time doing them. And so, how do you actually do that in practice? But here's going to be what we're going to do. Now, we already have these phi 1s and phi 2s. So let's come back to our code, pop these up, come over here. What I'm going to do is make a new file, and what we're going to do is decide, oh, actually, I'm just going to build it off the other code then, here. I'm going to come down here. Because I already have all the data here. And what I'm going to do is say, OK, my, uh, this is my reduced order model. OK? So what I'm going to do first is define phi is going to be first two columns of u. So I just built this. Okay, so I have that. It's going to be the columns of this. I still have to construct this guy. Uh, so now what I've got to do is take each column and take its derivative. Here's what I'm going to do. Uh, the first column of u, if you want to take a derivative, a really nice way to take derivatives is using the Fourier transform. Uh, you have this relationship that the Fourier transform of the second derivative is equal to minus k squared times the Fourier transform of the function. So all I have to do to compute the second derivative is take the Fourier transform of the function times k squared and then inverse Fourier transform it. So what I'm going to do is say the first derivative, if I look at the mode 1 xx, there'll be mode 1 xx will be the second derivative of the first mode. I can come back here and say, well, that's, that's not so hard to calculate. All I've got to do is take first column of u, FFT it. Then I just got to multiply it by k squared. Like that. Okay. And once I have that, so I have and a minus sign. Don't forget the minus sign. Okay. So it's minus k squared times the derivative of the, times Fourier transform of the function itself. And all I have to do is inverse Fourier transform that. EIFT. There we go. That is the second derivative of mode 1. I can copy and paste that there. And mode 2 is now the second column. And so phi, let's call this xx, is equal to mode 1, mode 2. Oops, mode 1, xx, mode 2, xx. So what I just built is this guy. It takes care of the linear terms. Again, I can pre-compute these very nicely. So I take the modes. I've made this matrix phi. Now I've made this derivative matrix called phi xx. Kind of ready to go. The right-hand side is going to be this stuff here. I've pre-computed this stuff, and I can send it all in. 
these modes never change. So once I compute these things, the only thing changing here is A. So what I'm going to send in to my right-hand side function is my modes, my initial conditions for A. Okay? So let's go ahead and solve this thing. So I'm going to do the following. I'm going to call time ut, let's call it uh, a t uh, a sol. So this is going to be the A solution. Remember, I'm not Fourier transferring now anything. So I'm going to actually just solve for A directly. Is equal to OD45. I'm going to call now A RHS. It's going to be the right-hand side of A, which is going to be all this. And what am I going to send in there? Well, first of all, I'm going to send in the time I'm going to solve it for. And I'm going to solve it from 0 to 2 pi, just like I did before. I'm going to solve it also for, I'm going to send in some initial conditions. Let's call it A naught. Let's talk about how we get A naught in just a second. So the initial values of A. I'm not sending in any kind of uh, terms, uh, you know, to, to change the tolerance setting. So I'll just leave that as an empty box. But I am sending in phi, phi xx. I need phi, I need phi xx. I have the i over 2 I don't need to send in, and then all this is going to be, the phi's are going to be sent in. Okay? So that's what I've got. So let's go and compute this right-hand side. And by the way, what do I get out before we go to the right-hand side and build it? Let's just talk about what comes out of this thing. What comes out of this thing is a sol, which is each row is a different time, which is a1, a2. It's, the, it's basically... Uh, Two by two for each, so it's, it's two columns of data. A1 is a function of time, A2 is a function of time. What is my solution? Well, it's A1 and A2 projected onto this phi matrix. So if I want it in time, then what I'm going to do is say, okay, what I need to do is if I want to look at different time slices, let me make the solution for J equals one to length T end. I'm just going to do this in kind of a simple, hopefully, easy way to think about it. What is my solution u at time t? Well, my solution u, right, this is going to be, remember I've decomposed it into a and b, but my solution what u was a 5r times a. So uh, what is going to happen is u at time, let's call this, uh, so I'm going to look at, uh, Okay, how does this stack up? So I'm going to get A sol 1 times phi 1 plus A sol 2 times phi 2. And this is going to give me, uh, these are columns, right? So A1 sol times phi 1, phi 1's a column, phi 1's a column, so I'm filling in. The jth time will be the full columns. So there you go. That's the idea. Is that what we have here is if we can solve for these a's, the a1 multiplies the, u, the phi1, the a2 multiplies the phi2, and then you put it all together. And this is at every single time step. You give me the a times phi1 plus a solve phi 2 and just update and then now I'm going to save it here in this u vector which is going to be uh, and I'm going to call this actually u sol the solution and then we can do the same thing we did before which is surfl u sol uh, shading terp uh, color map hot and let's make this figure 6 or something like that okay and plot it at the end now let's go build the right hand side so what we've done now is we've, we're going to project everything. This is calling now a 2 by 2 OD system. We have to build the right-hand side for it. So now let's open a new file. Okay. Function. Right-hand side equals A RHS. I'm sending in the time. Sending in the initial condition A. Just put it in as A. The dummy variable, phi, phi xx. So that's what's coming in. And what I got to just build is this. So 
the right hand side is equal to what? Well, I've got this i over 2 times phi transpose, right? Times phi xx times a. That's this term. I over 2, right, which is right here. Phi transpose, right there. Make sure to put the dot, by the way. Don't forget that dot. Because if you don't put the dot in there, it'll also complex conjugate your stuff. Now remember, this stuff's a complex number, so you don't want to do that. We get the wrong solution. So dot transpose, that's this. This is here. Okay? Then times a. The product of these two dudes is a two by two matrix. And you're going to inner product everything together. Plus I times, again, phi transpose times. Now what I got to do is basically say, well, I need uh, phi times A. I need this nonlinear function. So I want the absolute value of phi times A. Okay. Squared. times phi, phi times a. Okay. There we go. So we get the nonlinear terms. You take absolute value squared times this, inner product with that. That should be a right-hand side. Now, good chance I made a mistake, but let's just try it. <laughs> Save as. It should be a right-hand side dot m. Save. And let's go down here. So I'm going to just run this section. So yeah, that's what I thought. It's going to complain. Probably got some errors here that we're going to... A not undefined. Okay, that makes sense because we never defined it. <laughs> How do we define the initial conditions? Well, if you remember, what did I assume? U of xt is equal to A of t, psi of x. Or that's if you do a one-dimensional approximation. In our case here, we're making the approximation of phi of r times a. So at time t equals 0, this thing becomes phi of r a0, which was equal to 2 such x. Remember, this is a vector. So all I got to do is actually decide, remember this is, if you break it down into, uh, sorry, a little confusion here for a minute. So what I'm going to try to do is say, okay, what I need to do is just say uh, A0 then is basically multiply both sides by inverse psi, or sorry, psi transpose, right, times so that's your inner product projection. So that's how you get this thing. So you just basically, this is uh, essentially going to project the two sets onto mode 1 and 2. That's it. That's going to be A0. And I get it just from applying the initial condition, which I said was two sets. Okay, and then taking this, multiplying by psi r on both sides, and then I have it. Okay? So how does that play out in the code? Well, let's go right here in the code and just say A0 is equal to phi transpose times 2 okay that's it should be it so now I've projected the initial conditions onto these modes and the two sets is what I used, remember, in the full NLS simulation. And so now I have everything programmed up and ready to run. And here we go. And let's see what it's complaining about. Okay, matrix dimensions must agree. Uh, let's see here. I wonder if 
I'm going to have to do, let me just check. Okay, no, it doesn't like that. All right, so the problem with running it this way is that, okay, so I'm going to do the following. I'm going to just rerun. It doesn't tell you what line. So I'm going to go back up here. I'm going to make this only 256 modes so that we can run the thing, whole thing much faster. Now I'll complain, but at least it'll give me the line number. Okay? Okay, the initial condition. Let's just do real quick size. 250 of 2. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, oh, you know, I did this wrong. Here, let's, let's do the following. I, I was trying to take a shortcut, and of course I got jammed up with it. So, remember, our solution is A1 Psi 1 plus A2 Psi 2. Right? So now what I'm going to do is go ahead and uh, let me cut these down here so you can see me a little better. Uh, put in time zero. So at time t equals zero, this is two such x is equal to, this is at time zero, so a one zero psi one plus a two zero psi two. Okay, so now take the inner product of this whole thing with respect to psi one. So if you take it with respect to psi 1, psi 1 is ortho psi 1, psi 2 orthogonal. This cancels out, and I get 1 here. So I get a1, 0. That's 1. And then I get psi 1, 2 such x. And then if you do the same thing, take the inner product with respect to psi 2, then you get psi 2, 2 such. This becomes 0 because psi 1, psi 2 are orthogonal. And then you get psi 2, psi 2, which is 1. So a2, 0 is psi 2. Two such. Okay, we got a little sloppy there. So we come back here and you say, all right, so let's go back to where I defined my initial data down here. So really I need to do this like this. I'm going to say uh, A naught is going to be uh, what I can do is just simply take uh, the projection of psi. Uh, one uh, times two such, okay, and psi two times two such x. There's my inner products, okay, boom, and let me just make sure. So, uh, so it's it's a uh, one row, two hundred fifty columns. So a single row. So it's I actually want this then transposed like that. Okay, so let's try that. Oh, now we're down to surf. So we're going to do here absolute value. Okay. And I don't quite get the right thing just because I think I have a mistake in the code. But you kind of get the right idea. And uh, let me just try one thing here. Let's run it from the beginning again. 512 modes. And I think I just have some inner product that's off. Uh, but essentially, this is going to be the main idea in this, in this work, is you say, look, I can project everything out. Uh, and what I'm doing now is projecting everything in two-dimensional space. And what I'll do is I will upload a correct code. I'll fix this up. And what you'll see is that the two-mode expansion, which is not here, but it's the correct one will be available in the code will actually give you something that looks very similar to what we have in, in the full system. In fact, it's, it's going to be this basic dynamic system that oscillates around. Uh, and I, I, I have a bug here, but I'll put that up on the website. And then this is the idea, though, is that you build this two-dimensional model by simply 
projecting everything onto the space of functions that you find uh, in this process of looking for the SPOD modes and then projecting onto the space where the subspace spanned by mode one and two is what we've essentially done here. Okay, so I'll, I'll fix that up, send that along, and then you can uh, take a look at it. And I think um, I'll leave it there because I have to do a little bit of debugging. Uh, and then once I get that finished, code will be there. And that is how this POD expansion basis is going to essentially work in practice.